David. Hi, David. Um, I'm just going to give your little bio first okay. um, so that people don't confuse you with the creator of Shit's Creek. <laughs> but David is also Canadian. Um, he's a professor of sociology at the University of Western Ontario, and he's public, published work on basic income and catalysts and various academic outlets. He's also working on two projects, one on the work of Marxist sociologist Eric Olinwright with co-author Michael McCarthy, and another explaining why some welfare states are large and others are small. He also has a Jacobin talk on feasible socialism. And with that, we are going to go over to David. Thanks guys. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think you've set up this presentation really well. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna talk today about some big, kind of behemoth concepts in the socialist world, class and exploitation. Um, so in, in Jacobin circles, we of course use these words a lot, um, but what those words actually mean or ought to mean uh, is often, I think, somewhat unclear. So what I want to do is to try to give them a little bit of uh, precision to say what I think we mean when, when we use these terms, class and exploitation. And just to say up front what I'm trying to do here, um, I am going to give a structural account of class and exploitation. Okay, people use the term structural all the time, and I think it's often pretty unclear what we mean when we call something structural. Um, you know, aha, our critique is structural. Well, sometimes that's just a kind of stand in for, you know, our critique is. Uh, is pretty ferocious, it's really strongly stated. Um, well, that doesn't work. Um, it's not about how strong the critique is, um, you know, uh, or sometimes it means our critique is the deepest of all, right? It goes all the way down. Um, well, you know, that's fairly vague. <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is try to explain and contrast structural theories of class with individualistic theories of class. Um, and, and then I'm going to talk more about, you know, one kind of, of structural uh, theory of class, which is the exploitation approach. Um, and for people who are interested, what I'm doing here is basically I'm, I'm laying out Eric Olinwright's approach to, to, to these ideas, largely, you know, how, how he's presented them. I'm, I'm happy to share references uh, if people are interested. Uh, so, so social class, you know, is is a big, complex, thorny concept, both in academic research and and uh, more broadly in society. I think you can identify two main ways that people conceptualize class. Uh, the the first, and I'd say the the kind of dominant approach can be called the gradational um, or individualistic approach to class. The the second um, and the less intuitive, but deeper, we can call uh, the structural or the sort of relational approach to class. Okay, so in the first view, gradational approaches, society is a kind of ranking system. It's a lineup, right? Or it's a ladder um, with rungs. You know, there's lots of metaphors here. Um, and we might be talking about this or that attribute, right? It could be income, but it could also be status or health or wealth or housing, right? And you can more or less rank everybody, you know, on the ladder by how much they have, say by how much income they earn, right? And if we lined up everyone in society according uh, to their income, then you'd, you know, some people would be upper class, some people would be lower class, you know, and the vaunted middle class would, you know, that would just refer to people in the middle of the, of the income. Uh, distribution, right? So you've got a parade of people. Some have more, others have less of something. You know, but there's nothing in this view. There's nothing that connects uh, any one person in the lineup to anyone else, right? So that's the that's kind of the standard. Um, that's the standard view. Now, okay, the structural or relational view suggests instead that. Society is a kind of structure of social relations that binds people together, right? It binds the advantages of some to the disadvantages of others, 
right? So it's not just that some people have more and others have less, it's that their outcomes are connected, right? So their outcomes are connected and therefore their interests are connected, you know, through some kind of, uh, of social relation. Um, and when you, when you use, and the words rather that, that, that you use when you talk about class in this way, you want to use kind of relational words, right? So instead of words like rich, and poor, you know, which are not particularly relational. The fact that you have X amount of money doesn't really require a reference to someone else, right? It's a descriptor that, you know, that gloms onto you. Um, you know, so by contrast, here we're going to use relational descriptors, right? Capitalist, employers, employees, right? Employees only exist in a context where there are employers, right? Managers, supervisors, Right, supervisors implies a group of people who are supervised, right? Um, but also, you know, lords and serfs, slaves and slave owners. Um, you know, it's true that slave owners are richer. You know, they have more money than slaves, um, and they probably have better health outcomes, right? And in a slave society, you could line up all of the slaves and all of the slave owners. Um, you know, according to income, you know, or some attribute, right? Um, but you'd be missing a lot, right? You, you'd you be missing a lot if you just defined the two by saying that, you know, um, slave owners are, are, are rich and slaves, are, and slaves are, are, are poor, right? In fact, they're defined with respect to each other by, by a relationship. There's no meaning to the concept slave without there being a slave owner, you know, um, just like there's no meaning to the concept of parent without the concept of child, the Marxist concept proletariat doesn't have much meaning without the concept capitalist, right? You know, the very definition implies a kind of relationship to others. Um, so, you know, so relational approaches to class and inequality, they define positions, not just by the attributes that you have, not just by how much of something, but by the relationship to other people inside of a structure. Um, okay, so to uh, a couple stories here to kind of um, illustrate uh, these approaches. So, you know, this, this also comes from Eric, right? Um, first, uh, to illustrate the gradational approach, you might know the, the fable of the grasshopper and the ant. You've got, great, great, great pick there. Um, you've got the, you know, the lazy grasshopper and the industrious ant, and then when winter comes, the ant has saved up food and supplies, and the grasshopper is, is hungry. We have a have and a have not. Every political philosopher, you know, has his or her version of this story. You know, sometimes it's the tennis player and the gardener, or, you know, there's another well-known example where you have one guy named crazy and another guy named lazy, but, you know, but however you do it, at the end, of the story, you have a kind of inequality. You've got an ordering, right? The ant has more, the grasshopper has less. And then if you want to explain the inequality in this story, you don't have to invoke anything about the relationship between the two of them, right? The outcome is a, just a product of their separate individual attributes, right? Their separate dispositions and proclivities and habits and so on, right? There's nothing linking the ant's prosperity to the, you know, to the grasshopper's poverty, right? And when you describe the grasshopper as lazy, the ant as, as uh, industrious, these just don't involve descriptions of the other creature, right? You have two completely separate paths from, you know, attribute to outcome. And that's just, you know, a stylized depiction of how the world works in this, in this view, okay? All right, that's the gradational story. To then illustrate the relational uh, or structural approach. This, um, this, this originally comes from Alan Garfinkel's really brilliant book, Forms of Explanation. Um, Kale, maybe you can put up this uh, classroom slide. Um, so, okay, imagine the following. Imagine three identical classrooms. The only difference being uh, that in each, you have a very, you have very different grading schemes, different teachers, right? So, you have you know, three worlds, three universes that differ only in this one detail, right? It's, it's the identical classroom with identical students, but just you know, different teachers with different grading 
schemes, right? So one of the of the schemes is you know is really tough and and only gives out one A. Another is really generous and gives out all A's, and then the third you know is in the middle. Um, and if we can imagine you know the same student in three different worlds, we can you know so imagine this one person, the highlighted person, right, who has the same abilities, the same level of concentration, the same, you know, the same study habits, she writes the same exact exam, right, in all three uh, imaginary classrooms, but she ends up with very different grades, depending on the, you know, the different kind of macro structure, the different macro positions, the locations that, you know, people get slotted into. You know, that person has specific unchanged attributes, right? The attributes are unchanged, but those attributes alone do not determine ultimate outcomes, right? So inequality here depends, you know, not entirely on uh, what people's attributes are, their, you know, their individual efforts, but rather on, on macro rules of the game that, you know, that determine the overall distributions, right? And and, and studying, if you were to try to study this, you know, studying the behavior of, of individuals just it wouldn't tell you much about the resulting inequality, right? So this is a structural account of, of inequality, of class. Um, in the first case, all you need is an account of the individual attributes of the, uh, of the persons inside. Here, you need a separate account of the, of the structure, right? Um, you know, it's an account of the positions that are available for people to end up in, right? And then people relate to one another given the structure. You know, if there's only one A, uh, if someone takes the top box, there are implications for you. So uh, relational, these relational accounts of inequality, right? They're all attempts to kind of explain uh, the structure of relationships into which you know, people get sorted, uh, you know, so you might be born into a society with a stably high poverty rate or a stably high unemployment rate, you know, or you might be born into, you know, Sweden in the 1970s. You might be born into a world with very little un unemployment um, and poverty, right? Or you might be born into, you know, post um, Great Recession United States, a context with a lot of poverty and unemployment, right? That would really increase your, your risk of being unemployed or poor, whatever your attributes, um, right? So, you know, this is a little bit like uh, walking into different classrooms. Um, and at a higher level of, of abstraction, we can say that, you know, a slave economy, a slave structure with slaves and slave owners, you know, it has empty places for people to be slotted in, as does, you know, a feudal economy with, with lords and serfs, um, and, and the same with a capitalist economy, right? For, for any given person, their individual attributes just won't have much of an impact, you know, on the structure of the already existing empty places. Um, you know, and the view says that you just can't, this view says you can't, for example, get a full um, account of poverty just by adding up all of the all of the separate um, individual level accounts, right? Most poverty research in the United States, I think, makes this makes this exact mistake, right? They will discover that you know at the individual level, um, you know, classic kind of bit of research, single motherhood is is statistically um, is a st statistically significant correlate of, of poverty, right? And then um, they conclude, I think, falsely that, you know, aha, it, it causes poverty. But no, the, the U.S. social structure um, penalizes uh, single, single motherhood, right? But, you know, different countries with different structures and different uh, labor markets, welfare institutions, naturally, they produce different outcomes for, for single mothers, right? This is a mistake that, you know, I think all cultural, biological, and, you know, the liberal human capital uh, theories of poverty, I think they all make this, right? They, it's basically they're committing, um, you know, a, a kind of fallacy of, of composition, right? What's, what's true of a part is just not automatically 
true of uh, of the whole, right? Each separate part of the airplane cannot on its own fly in the air. Um, and even if it is true that education does reduce, you know, one person's uh, poverty risk, a, you know, a general increase in education might have no, you know, uh, effect on um, the, the rate of unemployment, right? So you can imagine an economy with, you know, eight empty places called that we can call jobs and two empty places called poverty, you know, with 10 individuals, both before and after some increase in educational attainment, you know, it's still going to be the case that the two sorry people will Will, will be inserted into, into poverty. Um, okay, so one more um, story, maybe this is beating a dead horse, but one more story just to kind of illustrate the, the structure idea. This one comes from a philosopher named Harold Kincaid. Okay, so imagine a group of dogs of varying sizes, strength, and you know, ability to snatch up bones. Uh, and then imagine further that these dogs uh, prefer you know, large bones to small ones. And, and when a bag of bones is tossed into, into the pen, you know, there's gonna be a final bone distribution. Some will have you know, large bones, others small ones, and some are you know, bone poor, having none, having none at all. And all of that is gonna get sorted out by a fight. Uh, that reflects the sort of individual doggy attributes, right? Um, the and then the individualist view of class is, would argue that look, dog poverty is just explained by the attributes of the of certain dogs, right? Perhaps some are small or they lack, you know, grit. They lack the tenacity that other dogs have. You know, perhaps they lack the kind of killer instinct or the cleverness, um, you know, that it's found among the bone rich dogs, right? So the structural counter argument uh, sees this account as insufficient. Uh, the final, you know, bone distribution just can't be fully explained by adding up each separate individual dog's attributes, right? Um, well, while it can tell us uh, in part who, who ends up with large rather than, rather than small bones, what's missing entirely is uh, a separate account of, you know, of the bones in the bag, right? A bag with more large bones than dogs is gonna produce a final distribution that's, that's very different from, from one with you know, few, fewer bones uh, than dogs, right? The existence of bone poverty in this example, uh, it turns out to rest uh, not just on, on, on dog attributes, but, but also on, on the overall availability of, of bones. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I was wondering if we could just expand on that a little with the way that, you know, in America, we talk about the meritocracy. And I think that that idea is based off of the false notion that there is a kind of distribution that matches each individual's attributes, um, how hard they work, how smart they are, their tenacity, et cetera, et cetera. But we've seen a change in the language um, I think maybe, you know, it's, it's nothing new on the left, but um, in popular parlance, now people are talking about um, the rigged economy or that it's a rigged game. And I think these are nods towards a structural explanation. But can you expand on what they're talking about saying that it's rigged? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's a nice way to put it. Um, one way to think about that, that term, the phrase uh, rigged, is just to say, you know, that there really are only so many places at the top of, uh, of a given class structure, right? Or, you know, within, you, could, you know, on the other side of it, you could say within, um, with, with a given level of, of unemployment, there's just going to be so many people, right, who will be jobless. And that, um, that I think, kind of maps on to this sort of bones in the bag, um, argument or you know A's in the in the classroom kind of structural perspective. I think it's I think it's basically another way to to talk about that this kind of concept of of structure. Um, yeah, rather than being an individual moral or intellectual failing, it's yeah. actually a result of you know how many seats there are in the 
<laughs> musical chairs game or what right. have you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So I, I think there, you know, there are potentially different ways to think about about structure broadly. This can, I think, get get more uh, complex. Um, so I think I think you you can think about structure really in 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 two ways, which which maybe I'll. Um, uh, get into so you can have this sort of like rigged economy approach. You can have the sort of this structural account of of outcomes. Um, you know what what I'm trying to get across in this classroom example. But you can also have a sort of structural account that explains why people fall where they fall. You know within a structure, right? Why some kids are more likely to get the A, even if there is only one. Uh, to get right, um, you know, you could have individualistic explanations there, right? This person was just talented, and that's why they, you know, got the the A and not others. And here, you know, your explanation primarily is going to reference the person alone, right? But if your if your account entails some kind of interaction with others, it really, if it references the situation that you are in, right? You know, I was born in a particular neighborhood, I had few opportunities. Um, there's this kind of like background of insufficient resources and so on. Then, you know, then I think you'd want to call it structural, right? You know, so so here there might be both structure as a kind of set of empty places for people to get slotted into and um, structure as, you know, and, and structure in the sense of where people, where people fall may also be shaped by these situational factors that really go beyond uh, reference to individuals and their and their separate talents. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that that kind of maps on to the argument that we hear around privilege, um, but not exactly. And I I wanted to go into this a little because I think there's a bait and switch where privilege politics acts like it's a structural explanation to the distribution of certain things. Um, but it appears to be more of an individual explanation that's masquerading as a structural explanation. Does that make, does my question make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what do you think of that? Do you think that, um, Privilege politics acts as though structures that exist are a byproduct of an aggregate of individuals' feelings, and that yeah. these biased structures can be changed if you change those individual feelings within them. Yeah. And yeah. so, in um, that way, it acts like a structural argument because it's explaining some structural process that's a relationship, but it's locating it within the individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So um, I don't know if I'm gonna have a very satisfactory answer, but I, you know, I think that w when when you talk about sort of biases or like implicit bias test, that that kind of discussion, I sort of just think that it's hard to imagine that these biases are anything but a kind of downstream ideological effect of prior material exclusions, right? What's the alternative? Uh, to that, right? What's the, the the only alternative to that kind of view is that there's some kind of bias. There's like a free floating bias that's just kind of rooted in our her inherent kind of group groupiness or something, right? Well, you know, if you're skeptical of of, of that, then I think you want you want to think about it as a as a consequence of prior exclusions, right? You know, I'm I'm a fan just in general of the much maligned base superstructure model, um, you know, sort of like appropriately kind of um, clarified and made in a sophisticated way. But, you know, this is anyway, this is a, of course, like a really thorny uh, question. You're My welcome. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> I mean, the way that I'm thinking about it, and like, I'll, I'll sort of elaborate in in a sec. But you know, my approach here is basically to kind of put it all sort of to the side and say, look, you've got structure as outcomes, right? classroom kind of example, and then structure as causes. Um, and that's really the sort of situational um, approach, which I'll say a little bit more about right now. But like, in the situational sort of uh, approach, you say, you know, where people land inside of some structure is going to be shaped 
by a bunch of things that you can call their situation. That includes all of it, you know, biases, right? You know, a direct racial animus, lack of resources, all, you know, all of it, you know? Um, and I'm just kind of doing it that way, you can sort of bracket kind of question of, um, of ultimate causes. Um, but may maybe I'll say a bit more about what, what I mean by, by that sort of second way of thinking about, about structure. Um, so yeah, you can think about you, you can think about this sort of second ap approach to to structure, you know, by distinguishing between in the literature it's called the person and, and the situation. This comes from a book by uh, Ross and and Nisbet, social psychologists. Um, so, for example, you know, someone didn't study much for for the exam, right? Is that fact explained by mechanisms that are connected? you know, only to that person, right? Is it characterological? Or, you know, would anyone in that same situation broadly defined act that way? You know, i.e. when there's stress or um, when they've got two jobs and there are insufficient resources and so on, right? And from, from this approach, when you wrongly attribute someone's, let's say someone's actions to, you know, to their character, you know, rather than their broad situation, researchers call that the fundamental attribution error, which is which is a, a cool term. Um, so, you know, that's the structural account of, of behavior. And so this, you know, view would be that, you know, situational explanations can explain, you know, the, you know, the, the lack of study. Um, and then macro structural explanations, i.e. the classroom example, they can tell us why the lack of study led to the outcome that it did, right? I.e. why it had the consequence of poverty, right? You know, because poverty was an empty place in that society for people to potentially fall into, um, right? So that, you know, the second explanation accounts for the behavior itself, you know, or the attribute and the first uh, accounts for why the behavior led to the outcome that it did, right? One is kind of structure of theory, you know, one is kind of structure as 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 consequences, as a theory of consequences. The other is structure as as a theory of causes. Um, okay, so so that's kind of that's the sort of setup. That's that's the background. Um, now I, I wanted to talk about some specific class theories. Um, I'll mention three uh, approaches and then kind of focus focus in on one. Um, okay, so so first, the individual attributes approach. So this is the dominant, this is the most common stratification approach that you will see. Um, and here, you know, again, we're looking at different attributes, say someone's uh, habits, their abilities, their, you know, education, their social network, their parents' wealth, you know, and you can also incorporate situational facts here too. But, you know, all of this is then used to predict their material conditions of life. In this, in this particular approach, right? Whether they end up having high income or low income, right? Whether they end up um, poor or rich, right? So this is a gradational view of inequality that gets linked to the attributes of, of persons. This is basically all research on poverty in America, right? In general, it takes uh, what you can call basic folk psychology, you know, aha, this person is a little too X, right? Um, and that's why they're poor. It takes kind of that, you know, basic folk psychology, you know, but instead of demystifying it, it, it you know, it reifies it, but, you know, at a very high level of, of statistical uh, sophistication. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of the first view. The second, uh, the second is a structural or a relational account, right, where we have social relations uh, between people. This is associated with Max Weber, the sociologist, and it's called uh, the opportunity hoarding approach, or sometimes it's called um, social closure, the social closure approach, right? So the idea here is that you occupy a position that is just not simply a product of your attributes, right? You have a position that instead is protected by some exclusion, right? Where it's an exclusion where some people are inside and other people are outside, right? So credentials are, you know, the most obvious um, here. Credentials are a mechanism of exclusion. An architect's stamp 
just means that, you know, some people are going to occupy the insider architect spot, right? This is basically what professionals do. Every professional association does this, right, in order to keep their incomes up, right? They make it difficult to get these credentials. They block people, right? Even totally capable ones from entering uh, from entering positions, right? So that's the, you know, that's opportunity hoarding, right? It's not, opportunity hoarding is not just about credentialed jobs, right? We can also talk about broader exclusions, exclusions from land, right? You are blocking people from using it, right? Property is a social relation because your ownership and use obstructs other people's ownership and use, right? So it's also property, means of production. Um, and it's also good neighborhoods. Redlining is about exclusions from you know, access to, to housing and to neighborhoods. And, and this, is, you know, this is why, and I'll come back to this, but this is why opportunity hoarding is one way to talk about the concept of, of oppression. Um, Okay, I'll get I'll get back to that. And then okay, so the third, the third approach, the third is is also a structural or a relational account. Um, it's associated with Marx. Um, it's also the most kind of complex. Um, and so I'm gonna expand on it, but um, so I wanna tell another story to get at this uh, exploitation approach to class. First, I'm just gonna give a sort of basic definition and then I will flesh it out, okay. So, so class in the exploitation approach, class is a structure of unequal social positions where some acquire economic benefits from the labor efforts of those excluded from ownership and control of, of productive assets. Okay, that's a mouthful, but the basic idea is that the advantages of some depend on the exclusions of others, just like, you know, just like number two, just like opportunity hoarding. And we're adding an additional point, and this forces the latter to work under the former, right? So, you know, some classroom spots are taken, and then the rest work for the spot holder. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna try to clarify this idea the concept of exploitation by way of the parable of the shmoo, uh, which is a comic strip by Al Cap from, from 1947. I'm gonna read it for you with, with some help from, from Ariella um, and, and Jen. Um, and you know, I like the strip because, well, it's fun and funny, but uh, most importantly, following from, you know, Eric, Eric Olin Wright and, and uh, G.A. Cohen before him, how they kind of talked about it. Um, you know, I think it has a pretty deep theoretical idea behind it. It helps to shed light on the concept of relationships that are exploitative. Um, so the story is, um, you know, it's about the shmoo, the shmoo, shmoo character who is a magical creature native to uh, the town of Dogpatch, uh, you know, in this comic strip, which is, exists in the mountains of Arkansas. You know, the shmoo kind of looks like a cross between between a, a turkey and uh, uh, and like a bowling pin, maybe. And this shmoo, you know, it has a, it has a superpower. It can transform itself into anything that that meets your your basic needs. Um, you know, so it can transform itself into breakfast if you so wish. Um, and but it always remembers to kind of duplicate itself before it does so, right? So you don't run out of the thing. Um, okay, so you know we're gonna read the strip, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna discuss the meaning. Um, so I okay, let's, I'm gonna assign some roles here. I'm gonna take the role of um, of like the first guy, the the industrialist person opportunity um, hoarding Jeez. i'm gonna i'm gonna hoard that guy's <laughs> role because yeah. it's the best um and so ariella i'm gonna actually know you i'm this how about you take the um the poor dog patch workers um all of them oh. they're the wretched and miserable um residents oh, you're gonna it's a good <laughs> hammy role I, it's actually it's the best one to take and also take you know the the driver who's 
who's also, okay. um, um, and then the other industrialist whose name is PU, um, maybe Jen, you take that. Yeah, is that okay? And then someone has to take Choo Choo, the, um, the, the poor show girl at the end. So who is gonna take that last position? All right, well. okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. So the, 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 the <laughs> workout. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, you know, as we begin the scene, um, we meet these uh, two industrialists entering entering the town of Dogpatch. Um, okay. Um, and and now, Pu, we're coming to a spot where folks are so ignorant they'd never dream of asking for more than we're willing to pay. And they'll never get rich. Here they that, haven't been eh? spoiled <laughs> by that silly fad of working a mere eight hour day. These miserable rats are in such desperate need that they'll work a good old fashioned 16 hour day. So I think that's you, Jen. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're a bright boy. How did you find well, such a splendid show spot? Statistics show that there are factory. more undernourished people in dog patch than any place. Those are the kind I like to deal with. They are so grateful, bless them. Uh, these poor ignorant wretches will be grateful for the chance to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week for $7 a week. They've never heard of anything better and chuckle, we'll never tell them. Oh, you're a bright lad. The board may well give you a $500,000 bonus again this year. But, hmm, maybe we can pay him even less. Question one of them? Uh, how would you like to earn $7 a week? Did you say $7 for just one week? <laughs> er, no, I said six. So that would have been a tremendous fortune, BS. <laughs> what do you mean, BS? Before schmooze. <laughs> Am I doing that Arkansas accent right? I'm doing my best here. It's dead on, yeah. <laughs> Only 18 hours of hard labor a day? Only seven days a week? And you'd pay us $6 for just that? That would have been a mighty juicy proposition, BS. Meaning before schmooze. But nobody what's got schmooze has any <laughs> to work anymore <laughs> and anybody can have them for free schmooze does everything everything ho ho i suppose they provide you with the necessities of life milk butter eggs meat stop laughing you fool look great scott p do you realize what the schmoo means nobody will have to work hard anymore but who'll do the long dreary back-breaking labor at our canning factories. Nobody, and what's worse, nobody will need our canned stuff anymore. The schmoo provides all types of food, fresh and sob free. Free food for everybody? That's horrible. The schmoo must go. It's either it or us. Thank heavens its sinister influence hasn't spread yet. Blast you, Wormley. Why are you stopping? Because I quit. Snug a brace of schmooze under my coat and dog patch. Now I've got a whole herd of them. I'll never have to take your guff anymore, P.U. I'll forget the schmoo menace by taking Choo Choo to dinner. That poor showgirl has been unemployed so long, she'll even go out with me for a square meal. Oh, I'd love to go to dinner with ugh, you, honeypot. I'll get you a big steak and... You can take that steak and slap your own fat face with it. There's good schmooze tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So, okay. So there's, I guess to, to start, there's, there's two, I think there's two stories uh, here actually, right? There's, there's the story about class um, and, you know, how, how, how the schmoo obstructs uh, class power, you know, but there's also at the very end, there's the story about, about gender, how the schmoo disrupts patriarchal uh, domination, you know, making women less economically dependent on men. And, um, you know, in the context of 1947, that is, that is really before feminists would have pushed these ideas into the, main, into the mainstream. 
Al Cap, as you can see from the strip, you know, is about as far from a feminist as, as you can get. The comic is just completely rife. If you read it, it's just, you know, it's rife with gratuitous sexism all over the place. The conclusion, this conclusion was not therefore, you know, rooted in his kind of values or his normative commitments, right? No, um, Eric Wright has, has kind of argued that really you should think about this as, as a kind of deduction. You know, Al Cap is just sort of following through the implications of his thought experiment. Um, and in this sense, you could see uh, the point as a kind of, as a real discovery, you know, that, that the Shmoo disrupts all sorts of, of relations of, of domination, both, both gender and class. Um, okay, so, but then moving to the question of class, um, let's, think about the, 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 the sort of interesting question um, that Eric asks, um, let's think about the sort of material interests of capitalists and workers with respect to the fate of the schmoo. So dog patch is this, you know, stylized model of the world. You've got owners and you've got workers, right? So let's ask of each of these people, what would be your material preferences? Um, on what to do with the shmoo, right? Not not moral, not your not their moral positions, just their you know their class interests, their material interests, right? Okay, so there's there's four possibilities. Everyone gets the schmoos. Only the capitalists get them. Only the workers get them, or nobody gets them, right? Those are the four options. So what is the first choice of of capitalists from this strip? What would be in you know most in their material interests? Well, you know, uh, only capitalists get them. Right, that would be number one. They like, you know, free breakfast, of course. The second option is to destroy the shmoo. Right, they are worse off when workers have them. All else equal. Um, the third is that everyone gets them, and then the worst option would be that only workers get them. Right. Well, that is a really, you know, that is quite a callous, a pretty dreadful um, set of preferences. Um, okay, so what are, what's the first choice of workers? Well, everyone gets it. Why? Most people are going to want to work and, you know, it's always better uh, to work for a capitalist who is slightly richer than one that is, you know, slightly more desperate. There's more wiggle room to bargain. There's slightly more money for reinvestment, right, which workers want. Um, the second uh, choice, only workers get it. The third, only capitalists get schmooze, right? Same logic as above, as before. Um, better to work for a capitalist with a little more wiggle room. And the fourth, and the fourth, the, the sort of worst outcome, destroy the the worst uh, is to destroy the the schmooze, right? Um, now it's interesting that you know when you think about virtually any kind of religious tradition or any you know um, big picture set of moral principles there is a parallel to the interests of workers. Uh, George Lukash, this you know, famous Marxist thinker, um, argues that the working class is, is a universal class. Um, and I think you can interpret that, uh, that in, in this way. Um, you know, it is, it's interesting, it's remarkable that the kind of raw, naked class interests of workers in this story corresponds to you know, basic principles of justice, and it's not because workers are high-minded um, and altruistic in some unique way. It's just a, a result of their situation, right? It's a result of their their situation, the situation of their class. Um, okay, but the key point, the key point of this story is that it's meant to get at the material um, at the point at the point that the material interests of employers depend they depend causally on the deprivations. Of, of workers, right? The owners, um, the owners' material interests, they are threatened when workers have the shmoo, right? When, when things just happen to be going well for them, right? When workers have an exit option, right? It's not that employers, the interests of employers are, are just different from, from workers in the story. They are actively opposed. Um, and it's not that they dislike the shmoo either because, you know, shmoos are costly um, and, you know, funded through, you know, taxing, um, taxing their capital. No, they're free in, the, in, in this thought experiment, right? They're manna from heaven. It's in, rather, it's that all else equal, the employers here have a positive interest in the disadvantage 
of workers. Um, because without that, you know, without that disadvantage, they, you know, wouldn't work or more to the point, they wouldn't work as hard and specifically on the terms that the employer prefers, right? So, you know, this is a case where the welfare of one depends on the ill fare of, of another. So, you know, this is a deeply interdependent uh, relationship that, that we're talking about, right? It's not just an inequality. It's an inequality where two parties are bound together, right? The advantage of one depends on the disadvantage of others, right? It's a structure that binds people's interests, and those interests are antagonistic, right? So, um, you know, this is, I think this is a powerful idea because it gets at this kind of deep interdependence of social classes that, you know, that's at the core of the capitalist labor market. It helps us understand uh, social social class as you know a relationship of exploitation, and it is why employment relationships um, often have you know a lot of discord and bitterness rather than um, you know harmony and and care. Um, okay, so schmooze do not, of course, exist, but the story shows that that capitalists do. Uh, benefit materially when all else equal the lives of the majority, you know, go badly. Um, and this is is why capitalists tend to like, tend to favor a decent amount of, of unemployment. It's why they dislike the welfare state. It's why they dislike social insurance schemes, even when those schemes are, you know, are costless and, and funded exclusively through kind of internal transfers within the working class, right? In the story, um, you know, in labor markets more broadly, capitalists and workers are, their fates are linked. They're linked inside of a structure of social relations, just, you know, just like the classroom example, right? Because the well-being of workers, it impacts employers only if there's some amount of, you know, unemployment, some background condition of hardship for workers, uh, can, can capitalists, you know, really force uh, compliance at work, um, which is, you know, which is how they get their um, needs met, right? Um, if there's relatively high unemployment, you're going to have power over people when they're at work, right? Um, because that way being fired is, is painful. Um, if, you know, if firing someone at their, at their job today means that they can get a job elsewhere easily, you know, you're not really imposing, sacking someone is not really imposing a cost on them, right? For the statement, you are fired uh, to really instill fear, to really force compliance, you need the alternative uh, to be bad. Um, so, and this is why capitalists like to have some unemployment. It's a source of their power, right? That's the kind of, so that's the sort of conclusion here. Um, capitalists really, you know, do have this kind of active interest, all else equal, in workers' lives going, going badly, to put it, to put it crudely, if there was a garden of Eden, right, if manna did fall from, from heaven, you know, a rational capitalist would want to destroy it. And it's not, this is not a conspiracy. And it's not because capitalists are mean people. It, you know, it would simply just be in their interests that, that it be destroyed. Um, okay, so that, that is class as exploitation. Um, it's when, you know, it's when one group's advantage depends on another group's disadvantage. And and, and through that disadvantage, the first group can benefit from the labor, from the labor effort of the, of the second, right? Um, and in the, you know, in the classic uh, historical case, you've got, you've got landowners that seize common lands and kick off peasants, right? So far, this is just an exclusion. So far, this is just, you know, social closure, opportunity hoarding. But when the peasants who no longer have land then get rehired, um, by landowners, now that's exploitation, right? So by, you know, by virtue of that exclusion, landowners benefit from the labor of, of peasants, right? Just, just like the sort of exclusion from the schmoo uh, enables the capitalists to, to benefit from, from, the, from the work of, of dog patch workers. Um, so David, I just want to yeah. quickly cut in um, to talk a little bit about kind of that point of hiring, because I think we often hear the sort of libertarian argument 
uh, that when workers are hired by an employer, that's a consensual contract. That's two parties coming together and sort of like deciding that they're going to work together, right? Um, so how does that fit into this kind of overall um, theory of exploitation? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that kind of connects to what is basically the sort of um, foundational Marxist criticism of capitalist labor markets, right? Which is, you know, they are labor, labor markets are superficially free, but they are substantively unfree, right? Yes, we can choose between capitalists, but we are forced uh, to choose one, right? Marx calls this the, the double freedom, right? We are, we're free to sell our labor to whomever we choose and failing that we are free to starve to death, right? Um, yeah, so by, you know, and by forcing, by forcing people to, to work in this sense for an, for an employer, capitalism restricts our freedom, you know, our, our negative freedom, right? And using libertarian language, right? Um, and, you know, I think the sort of response to, to that comment is that, you know, really on libertarian uh, grounds, libertarians ought to be critical of the, you know, of the structure of unfreedom in, in, capitalist, in capitalist labor markets. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think we see this too. We made a point earlier that, um, you know, with the Tim Ryan clip that you have people um, broadly opposing social programs that would help the bulk of people saying it's for the working class, it's for the working class. And in this example, you know, they would be slaughtering every single schmoo saying like, you want to take the satisfaction of a hard day's work and a shower afterwards away from the working man, <laughs> that's evil. Um, and, and I think it's, later in the trip. yeah, it does. I wonder what it, was it a pressure exploitation that made us read that tonight? <laughs> I'm <exploiting you>. <laughs> <laughs> Coercion. Um, yeah, I think we can really see what's behind the broad opposition to these things that have a tremendous amount of popular support from the working class and and we're told, oh no, you can't have free college. What if a rich kid gets it? It's exactly like the kind of matrix of options that you put up earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just, um, I just have a, a few more things to say about, about oppression and exploitation and I'll give, I'll kind of close by, by giving um, a, a few examples as well. And this is this is maybe um, this is this is also Eric Wright's kind of reconstruction of, of Romer's work, um, and he's trying to you know he's giving some kind of he's giving high level definitions of, of oppression and, and exploitation. So I'll I'll just I'll state them them both, um, and then I'll try to sort of simplify or boil down some of the what I think the the big takeaways are. Um, okay, so his his basic definition of oppression is okay. Oh, good, it's up. Um, so. The basic definition of oppression is the material welfare of group A causally depends on the deprivations of group B, right? My welfare depends on your ill-fare. And this operates through B's exclusion from access to some important economic resource, right? So land, jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, usually exclusion is backed by, by force through, through, pop, through uh, property rights, okay? And then to get to exploitation, you, you add in the following, right? So those exclusions that we're talking about generate antagonistic interest through A's appropriation of B's labor effort, right? So now you aren't just excluded, now you're working for me, right? Now my welfare depends on your effort and work, right? The fruits of your labor. So um, I think you can, you, you can simplify this with a thought experiment. Um, you know, and this is how you'll know if uh, in specific cases, whether we're talking about uh, uh, oppression or, or, or exploitation, right? So if the dominated, here's, here, here's how it goes. If the dominated group simply stopped existing, died, stopped working, and the dominant group is worse off, then that's exploitation, right? If the dominant group is better off, then it was oppression, most likely, right? So I think you can take these concepts and you know put them to work. Um, so historically, so when we think about peasants getting kicked off of, uh, of off of the commons, you know, and being 
uh, hired back. This is this is clearly exploitation. Um, when when we think about slavery in the Americas, uh, this is um, this is exploitation, right? The dominant group would be worse off if the dominated were to disappear, right? Um, now, um, by contrast, when we talk about say the genocide of Native Americans, really this is I think a case of of oppression, right? There's a brutal and cruel phrase that's you know a part of American history go, that, that goes back to the Civil War, which is quote uh, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, well, you know this is basically like I, this is basically a sort of Nazi attitude, but it is part of American history. It was then repeated um, by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, okay, well you know it's evil, um, but it's intelligible, right? It makes sense because the dynamic is one of oppression, right? You would not say that the only um, good worker is a dead worker, right? You would not say the only good slave is a dead slave, right? You might say the only good slave is, you know, is a uh, compliant or deferential slave, but not you, not a dead slave, right? And so you can use the kind of exploitation, oppression, dichotomy to diagnose circumstances. Um, and even, I think, to make predictions, um, right? So a dynamic of oppression can potentially become genocidal, right? But an exploitative one probably would not. Um, solutions like mass incarceration might make sense in cases of oppression. Um, oppression is probably, you know, a, a better way to capture the circumstances of the very poor, the most marginal um, in America, right? You know, people often want the homeless just to disappear. Um, I think, you know, I think you can potentially push this sort of distinction a little bit too far uh, as well. I don't think it works entirely, but you might want to think about women in a traditional division of labor as exploited in a sense, right? Exploited by men. Um, gay people, for, uh, for example, really, no, this is probably a case of oppression, right? Um, and okay, so I'm gonna, I will, I'm gonna close, um, I'm gonna close just with what, what I think are sort of a couple uh, insights of, about oppression and exploitation in particular. So um, however you want to extend these ideas, here is what I think is the kind of, you know, fundamental Marxist insight um, about, about exploitation in particular. So exploitation is a form of oppression that gives power to the exploited, right? So they have levers of, of of struggle and resistance that are just absent from cases of brute oppression. And that makes exploitative relations sometimes very tense and sometimes very volatile, um, you know, because exploiters need um, the exploited. And, you know, so this is a big reason why Marxists and socialists often, you know, why they talk so much about the exploited. It's not because they suffer the most. Um, right, or have some special moral standing. They really do not. Um, it's because in Marxist views of social change or socialist views, you know, it's the exploited that have these, that have levers, uh, you know, levers of power to extract concessions, right? Well, that's not, I think that's not the only way to think about social change, but it's probably um, an important one. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so, David, I, I want to start with just one question for you. Um, I think, you know, at the concept of exploitation, as you've kind of laid it out here, is really helpful for sort of cutting through some of the obfuscations that we were talking about earlier, um, you know, particularly in the U.S., where um, people, I think, especially politicians, as we said, tend to think about class as like a matter of culture or like a kind of like mishmash of education and income. Um, but I think something I want to ask you is, is if we define class exclusively as a matter of whether or not you're exploited, um, that that's a lot of people, right? And I think that that sometimes ends up itself being a little overly broad. Um, so, you know, I know that 
a, a lot of people have sort of um, looked at how looked at how the working class can be sort of broken up into sort of different strata as well. So I think the most famous example is probably like Barbara and John Ehrenreich talking about the professional managerial class. Um, but you also see like Bernie Sanders, for example, saying things like political class. Um, and I think that these are different ways of kind of getting at the different divisions that exist between, you know, the vast group of people who have to work for a living. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess what I want to ask you is, how do we begin thinking about the different divisions between, mm -hmm. as I say, the majority of people who have to work for a living? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there you can have a, a kind of generic answer to this question about what is the best way to, you know, think about the working class or what's the best model to think about class. You know, I would not say that the two class model, you know, in sort of classic Marxist approach is, um, you know, is too broad or too narrow. It's just a particular answer to particular kinds of questions, Qu you know, questions, you know, so with respect to some questions, that model is going to be really, that approach is going to be really useful. And with respect to other questions, it's just not, right? So like, if you're interested in understanding people's life chances or their voting patterns, the two class model is going to be completely awful. It's not going to work, right? But if you're interested in trying to understand these uh, core antagonisms, um, I think it's useful um, and illuminating. Um, and on on sort of this you know, professional manager managerial class uh, um, uh, thing, sort of on professionals. So from the way that I'm presenting it here, um, the way you'd think about professionals is that basically they are, you know, they are opportunity hoarders. You know, via their credentialed status, they create closure. To, to access to certain jobs and resources. So, you know, in this way of thinking about it, you would say professionals oppress, but they do not exploit um, ordinary workers. Um, but, you know, there are other ways to, to think broadly about, about the middle class, I think in a way that's also kind of consistent with the sort of like big two class approach, um, particularly Eric Wright has done lots of work on, on this. So the sort of standard way would be to say, yes, capitalists are people who, you know, who own and control the means of production. Workers are people who neither own nor control the means of production. But then you have like other middle class positions that you that you can get if you kind of look at the other potential permutations, right? So supervisors, managers, these are people who have some control, but no ownership um, over the means of production and, and labor, right? And then, you know, self-employed or, or petty bourgeois classes, they're gonna have ownership over, over means of production, but no control or authority over labor. Um, you know, and I think that, that that's an interesting way to, to look at it because you can start to see, okay, well, where might some political alliances get formed, right? So, you know, workers and supervisors or managers, well, they might form alliances around say taxing the rich or around Medicare for all. But, you know, managers and supervisors are going to resist kind of, you know, calls for more democracy in the workplace, right? That alliance will break down there. So like self-employed um, or bourgeois, you know, petty bourgeois classes, they might resist taxing capital. Um, but, you know, you could potentially um, ally with them on, on other questions. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and this framework is really helpful for parsing out why we need to think strategically instead of just gesturing towards acknowledging certain issues. Um, there's an oft flung accusation that socialists only care about class or exploitation and not oppression, like class reductionists. Um, how can this framework help us understand when and why there should be a focus on class um, or the difference between a strategic focus on exploitation or oppression versus like a moral obligation to focus on one of those things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. And yeah, also really good. Hour three of the talk, David. <laughs> yeah. <please. laughs> so, um, yeah, it's right that that you know Marxists focus, socialists focus on exploitation, the working class, and yeah, it's not because workers suffer the most. Clearly, they do not. You know, the very poorest, the you know, the homeless face the worst conditions, and I think ought to command you know greater moral concern 
Um, you know, Joan Robinson says the only thing worse than being exploited is not being exploited. Um, and, you know, the, but the focus on classes, I should say the focus on class is also not because class, you know, for socialists is, you know, the most salient identity uh, to people. It's not. I mean, that's an empirical question. It just may or may not be. You can't, you can't tell someone, no, you're really, you really, you're a worker rather than, you know, being a Catholic or a, or a woman or whatever it is. No. Um, you know, the Marxist point isn't, isn't about that. It's just that the point is just that there are, there is a kind of power that is available to workers because they are needed. Their place in the class structure empowers them in a way that it doesn't empower um, the oppressed. You know, so I mean, so that's the that's the Marxist argument. But I, I guess I would also say that it's not the only argument um, in in play here. There are other sources of power that are available to the oppressed. It's just you know you'd have to you'd have to look to non what I would say are non Marxist mechanisms. Um, you know, so if you if you're an elderly person, if you are oppressed but not exploited in a in you know in a de in a capitalist democracy, you're often going to rely on the welfare state, right? You know, non-workers are like more than forty percent, or somewhere somewhere around forty percent of the population, and the welfare state turns out to be pretty robust. It is you know even in a context like the United States, social spending tends to go up and not down in in the long run, and you know, so why is that? I think in part, it's because this stuff is really, really popular. Um, and politicians who try to impose um, austerity programs are never popular, right? Libertarian ideology has just like never worked. Um, we'll as see a math how that turns out for Mitch McConnell. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like but, Trump yeah. did a 180 in a few days of becoming on the yeah. side of the Democrats with offering $2,000 stimulus relief. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and Paul Ryan's career never kind of, you know, never took off in the way he, in the way he hoped. Um, you know, healthcare programs are, are introduced in countries and they are never ever repealed. And I think that's because they're, they're popular. So, you know, that, to my mind, that's a different angle from, from the Marxist one. And it's empirically fairly powerful. Um, and I just think both are in play. Um, in, in a capitalist democracy. So I have another kind of broad question for you, and that's whether we can think of race as a structure the way you've just laid out, we should be thinking about class as a structure. Um, and I ask this because I think, especially right now, we've been hearing the phrase structural racism a lot, and I think it's not always clear what that means. Um, so are, are the two comparable in that way? Yeah. Um, so I don't have a canonical answer to this. Um, it's I think it's like a it's sort of a, a difficult question to, to to think through. I think in some cases you might you might want to say that yeah race is a structure. So take the case of something like redlining, you know, or if whites hoard good jobs and exclude uh, blacks, then you know then there's a kind of race class structure. There are insiders and outsiders. It's a parallel to, to the way that I'm talking about things in the classroom example. It's a relation. You know, whites are worse off if you eliminate the structure. Um, I think slavery would be the, you know, the best example. Slavery is a class structure, right? It is the ownership of persons and that maps on to race. Um, you know, so these are cases where I think, you know, class mechanisms and race mechanisms really are one. Um, I'd say that's not true in general, you know, it's a emp completely empirical question, but in those cases it, it works. But, but the question of, you know, can race per se, um, disconnected from class, can race per se be a structure? I don't really think that works. Um, unless you want to make an argument that, that sort of race is, is a, is a structure of statuses. Um, where the status of, of you know, where, say the status of blacks and whites are, you know, inversely related. Um, you could say that. Um, I don't really think it maps on to the real world. I think lots of, you know, white people really won't be worse off um, were you to improve the status of, of blacks. Um, you know, so when we talk about it in this way, when you talk about uh, structure as consequences, you know, the classroom example, then I think for the most part, no, you don't really want to say that race per se has a structure. Um, but it, if instead you kind of talk about it in the sort of second way that I was, I was trying to, to frame things, you know, structure as, as causes, the kind of situational argument, right, sort of 
explanations for placement inside of a, of a, of a class structure, you know, why black people are more likely to be unemployed. Well, then, you know, then I think it, it makes sense to talk about, um, you know, structural racism. What explains, you know, who, um, who falls where inside of a class structure? There you can offer situational explanations. And, you know, it could be the case that where someone falls is determined by whatever, abilities and skills, but it could also be determined by education and parental resources and discrimination or prior inequalities, right? People in those, you know, situations would, would just be more likely to fall into lower slots in the class structure. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think you could say race, race is, is potentially structural in that. Thank you so much, David. We want to keep you around for a third hour of questions, <laughs> but we have to let our viewers go uh, onto their lives. Um, we would love to have you come back on the show, though. Um, it's it's really been great. 